Daniel Levitin, who was previously on the stage a couple of years ago, talking about uh, the brain and how it reacts to music, along with Edwin Outwater, who is the conductor of the Kitchener-Waterloo Orchestra, and they together with Stuart Goodyear at the piano are going to give us a little talk about what happens when your brain comes in contact with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So this is Daniel Levitin. Edwin Outwater. And Stuart Goodyear. And Stuart Goodyear. Well, we're delighted to be here, and uh, thanks for having us here. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, we come with, I come with one big idea, and that is that you can learn a lot about the brain by studying music. And my big idea is you can learn a lot about music by studying the brain. And this is Stuart Goodyear. We usually do this show with an orchestra. Stuart is an orchestra unto himself, and he has lots of ideas, but today he's going to play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony uh, in the next few minutes. And of course, the most famous thing about Beethoven's Fifth is... And not surprisingly, it's also the most important thing. Let's start there. Dan, what do these four notes, which we call a motif in music, mean from a neuroscience perspective? Well, motifs don't just occur in music, of course. They occur in speech, in poetry, and especially in oration that combines the two. Take, for example, Martin Luther King's stirring, I have a dream speech, which repeated those four words, I have a dream, nine times. And he repeats the phrase, let freedom ring, ten times each with a different context and a different inflection. Motifs occur in all styles of music as well. Take the famous Paul McCartney song, Yesterday. The basic motif is da da da, short, short, long, short, short, long, where the last two notes are the same pitch and they're a whole step lower than the first note. Listen to how McCartney uses this motif several times through the piece. Short, short, long, all my troubles seem so short, short, long. Now it looks as though they're short, short, long. Oh, I believe in short, short, long. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and notice he does something interesting on the very last one. He inverts it, playing it upside down, so that the two final notes are now higher than the first note. And although you've probably heard this song thousands of times and not been aware of any of this, your brain is aware. The brain is a giant pattern detector and it picks out these patterns wherever they are. I think it's fair to say that Beethoven is a master of the motif. He uses these famous four notes in all sorts of different ways in the first movement of his fifth symphony, which is only eight minutes long. Sometimes you can feel exactly where these notes are going to happen. You're headed towards them and there's no stopping. Other times, those four notes, the motif shocks you out of a calm state. Sometimes the motif is in the background. Here's an example from the first movement. Under the melody in the right hand of the piano, you can hear the motif rumbling in the lower register, making a calm moment slightly unstable. We're drawn to motif because it serves as a signpost, a reference point that stays more or less the same as we go down the musical road. And part of our attraction to motifs has to do with what you said earlier about how you feel the motif coming and that it can't be stopped. It's that sense of inevitability or momentum, which is a lot of what makes Beethoven so powerful. Melodies and motifs undergo changes in the hands of skillful composers, and that's what we heard there at the end of yesterday. It's as though McCartney took the melodic door off its hinges and turned it upside down, but we still know that it's the same door. Beethoven does the same thing, of course. Yes, and he takes it even further. As a building block, Beethoven's motif is really effective for a lot of reasons. First, there's the purity and power of how it's presented at the very beginning. The whole orchestra plays it in unison, and it seems to come out of nowhere, like a shock. 
Beethoven will build things out of this motif in myriad ways, each one of which feels inevitable and original. In the opening statement, he creates emotional instability by playing the motif with pauses that are completely out of pulse and rhythm. So let's set the music in motion, and while you're listening, we want you to get in touch with your brain as it detects patterns, so we're going to give you a job to do. Try to count how many times you hear Stuart play that motif, da 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 da. The pitches don't have to be the same, just the ry rhythmic gesture, and we're gonna quiz you in just a minute. If you counted correctly, you would know that the motif occurs 60 times. That's six zero times in the section you just heard. This is really fundamental, and I'd like to say, Edwin and Stuart, I think you put the fun in fundamental. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I guess you put the mental in fundamental. <laughs> Well, anyway, by making you count, we wanted you to feel exactly what is going on in your brain as it's processing this information as you're listening. So what exactly is going on while that's happening? Well, at the first level, Beethoven's trying to shake us up, to make us uncomfortable through his use of the instability in the music. The longer he can make us uncomfortable without us wanting to just stand up and walk out of the room, the more satisfying will be the resolution when he finally brings us there. Also, whether you know it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you're a musician or not, our brains are taking in each note and trying to figure out what's going to come next. The brain's a giant prediction device. Circuits in the prefrontal cortex here are working hard to predict what note is going to come next. Because the music generally has a steady pulse, being kept track of by your cerebellum and basal ganglia back there, your brain pretty much knows when the next note's going to be, but it doesn't know what it's going to be. And the skillful composer has to play around with this sense of expectation, rewarding them sometimes, violating them other times in order to hold your interest. Beethoven's playing with your powers of prediction. It's this physical, neurological aspect of music that our presentation that we're doing called Beethoven Your Brain discusses. Though there are many things to understand about Beethoven, our body and nervous system grasp the meaning of Beethoven's music, and in fact, of all music, almost immediately. So even if you think you don't understand Beethoven, circuits in your brain do. And all of those things, the thrills and the chills and the physical reactions that you get from it are being driven by your brain's intuitive understanding. Thank you, Stuart, and thank all of you. Hey. Your reward is a picture with me. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. No, I'll stand you want to get there. in the middle? Yeah. You okay? Yeah, I'll stand there. Here. That was splendid. Thank you so much. It's cheap, but it's not free. <laughs> a rose among three thorns. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Follow me up. Off That's this great. Way. Sure. All right. Thanks, guys. That Thank was you. excellent. Yeah.